2017 Water Supply Advisory Committee. And the first item on the agenda is, well, <coughs> so there was talk about going around the room and everybody saying who they are during the roll call, but we don't have to do roll calls anymore. Yay! <laughs> 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 uh, if you guys want, we can still go around the room and everybody can say who they are and what they represent. We'll go ahead. We'll do it by table. So I'm Wendy Wolf. I am a council member for the Met Council representing a lot of Dakota County and a little bit of Scott County and the chair. Hi, Annika Bankston. I'm the director of the Division of Water Treatment and Distribution Services for the City of Minneapolis. I'm Tanya West Hafner. I'm a city council member for the City of Brooklyn Park. I'm Mike Wong. I'm a city council member for the City of Chaska. I'm Catherine Neusler. I'm the manager of the water assessment section at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Uh, I'm Phil Klein. I sit on the uh, city council at Hugo. Uh, Brad Larson, the city administrator for the city of Savage. Uh, Kevin Watson, city administrator of Baden Sykes. Jeff Berg, water policy specialist, Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Valerie Neffel, Dakota County um, groundwater protection supervisor uh, for the environmental resource department. Yeah, what say who they are too. Wendy Ross, Water Supply Planning Unit, Met Council. Emily Steinweg, also Water Supply. And I'm also the TAC Chair. You can see me around. Oh, I was going to take off my mask so you can see my face. Uh, Jen Kostruski, Water Resources. Thank you for having me here today. I'm Sam Paskey, I'm Assistant General Manager at the Met Council. Ali Al Hassan, who's Water Supply Planning. Tessa Waginki, Program Technical Specialist for um, Administration and Communications and Support from OSAC. I'm Angela Torres, the Manager of Local Planning Assistance at the Met Council. Uh, I'm Dan Markell. I'm in uh, Community Development here at the Council. I'm Mike Larson. I'm Staff in Local Planning Assistance, a part of the Community Development Division. Hi, I'm Raya Smiley. I'm also Staff in uh, Community Development and Local Planning Assistance. I'm Deb Dietrich also in local planning assistance and coordinator for the land use advisory committee for another month <laughs> yes. she's retiring <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, we have the approval of the agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Thank you. Um, all of any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nobody. Passes unanimously. Uh, next up is the approval of the March 15, 2022 MOSFET meeting minutes. We have a, a motion and a second for the minutes. Move to approve. Second. And any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Again, unanimous. Okay, so then we will be moving on to our information item. And uh, the purpose today is to understand key opportunities for the committee to influence the update of the Regional Development Guide and Related Policy and System Plan and share perspectives with Metropolitan Council project managers who are leading the regional plan update projects. And that comes out of the work plan which we talked about at our last meeting. There's a revised work plan in today's meeting materials um, based on the conversations at the last meeting, like having three hour meetings and not as many. Um, and uh, our goal is to end the year with a summary of how MOSAC has influenced the council's regional development guide, water resources policy plan, master water supply plan, and other plans and projects. The draft water supply vision and goal content for chapter one of the master water supply plan informed by the 2022 MOSAC report, a draft approach or work plan to engage sub-regional water supply work groups in 2023 to help local water supply plans better reflect sub-regional concerns and goals and to identify opportunities that benefit multiple communities and advance our regional vision. And documented strong committee support for the sub-regional approach and commitment to help promote the sub-regional work in 2023 and beyond. So uh, to accomplish 
accomplish today's meeting purpose, staff will present some background information and then we'll break for posters and refreshments and small group work will follow. So go ahead, Lanya, and kick us off. Thank you. And I'm sorry for putting the list of things in your talking points. <laughs> These are all, those are all in your uh, updated work plan, so that's part of the meeting materials. Can you take your, is it possible for you to take your mask off? I have a hard time asking? understanding people yeah. that talk with the mask on. Does anybody have a Does anybody problem? Have any problem that my my kid is in a school where there's been a rising number of COVID cases, so just stay way over there. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you actually go over there? <laughs> <laughs> she she works down the down the hall. Um, is that better? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, so today we're going to hear some presentations that are related to the update of the regional development plan and the policy plans. And so I'll thank you to our presenters for being here to share some of that information today and to listen to the committee during the small group discussions to follow. So I'm just going to walk you through some high level framing information and then I'm going to pass the torch to a series of very short presentations. So as presenters are speaking, um, there's some sheets of paper and some pens at the table um, as you have questions please jot them down, and then when everybody's done speaking, we'll have a Q&A session, and the presenters are also available to have conversations and follow up during the break, but you'll get to speak to them much more deeply during the small group discussions to follow. So that's the approach we're proposing to take here, just to keep us all on time, if that works for everybody. So, to Keep grounded in the purpose of today's conversation. We are going to, I'm going to share a couple of points from your 2022 work plan and report. And again, trying to find those connections between what you worked on last year and some current efforts at the council, because this is one way that you as a committee can be influential and amplify your voice and your impact. We've already covered this. This is just if you hadn't had a chance to look at the work plan, uh, we do have sort of objectives to achieve by the end of the year. Um, in the spring, getting some early input, uh, spending the summer meeting focused on a sub regional approach and uh, clarifying some shared goals. And then in the fall, really focusing on collaboration with sub regional water supply work groups. So that's just the trajectory after today's meeting. Again, blast from the past, if you haven't looked at that report in a while, I did want to refresh thinking about how your articulation of goals in the area of water quality, land use and water supply connections, understanding groundwater and surface water interactions, and water supply infrastructure were highlighted in your report to the council and to the legislature. And I did want to just quickly acknowledge that that report was shared and has been shared with our council staff working on a lot of these projects. And we've also been sharing with the Minnesota Subcommittee on Water Policy, with the Clean Water Council, and so that is information that is being considered by a wide variety of audiences. And so wanted to highlight that good work and that focus. By no means does today's conversation have to stay only focused in these areas, but just uh, this is an opportunity to promote those goals. And to help kind of understand the big framework that we're working in, beyond just water supply and the master water supply plan, there's actually a large package of uh, regional policy and system plan and program development that is being worked on at the council. Um, and we're kicking off the update of that. It's a 10 year update process. Uh, right now and so this is just one of the ways that I think about this we shared this at the last meeting too but um, you know kind of above everything and setting the vision we have a regional uh, it's called regional planning framework commonly known as the metropolitan development guide the regional development guide it goes by a couple of different names but that's that high level vision thrive MSP 2040 is the current version of that um, that feeds into and is supported by the water resources policy plan setting regional <coughs> policy uh, the wastewater system plan, and then focused on water supply, the master water supply plan provides more detail and more direction on water supply, but they're very closely connected. Um, and we are proposing this time to include a, a 
stronger focus on sub-regional chapters. So working with our sub-regional work groups to customize content um, more for the different issues that different parts of the region face. And so that's you know, this water supply focus. We talked about doing chapter one or the sub-regional approach to water supply planning later in the year. This is the area we're talking about. And that, of course, then feeds into um, local implementation. So expectations for local water supply plans, um, programs to support local water supply plan implementation, and that work. So together, they work together to make this package of regional planning so we're all moving forward towards some shared goals. So that's where some of the projects that we invited to come today fit in. So we're going to hear about um, various things, mostly up in this section of the work, and then later in the summer and into the fall, we'll be working down in this part of the framework. Are there any questions with that? <coughs> So uh, the specific projects we're going to hear about today are regional values, vision, and goals, uh, community designations, scenario planning, and some water issue white papers that are connected to the Water Resource Policy Plan update. So we're going to hear some very short challenges, five minutes each, <laughs> lightning round presentations, what this is, what the ask is. Um, <clears throat> capture your questions, because we'll have some, a short Q&A after those presentations. Uh, again, Mentimeter is not working for us today, I apologize. Um, but then we'll break and come back for two rounds of small group discussion. We'll spend 20 minutes on one topic, and then you'll switch to speak on another topic for 20 minutes. And so that is the plan. Are we game to try it? Ready to go. All right. Are you chiming me? I'm going to pass the baton. <laughs> To Michael Larson. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you in person, uh, finally. I'm Mike Larson, again. I'm planning analyst in the Community Development Division, um, and I'm managing the um, process for identifying a set of regional values, uh, vision uh, for the region, and a set of goals for, for the Regional Development Guide, the 2015 Regional Development Guide. And just broadly, for we are trying to create um, a, a mental picture of a desired future for the, for the region, uh, one that is relatively inspirational as well as unambiguous and, and high-level language that sets the direction for plan and policy development. Uh, and obviously, water resources are an important, uh, important part of the region, and so looking forward to learning um, from you today. Um, I have to confess, this is my first MOSAC meeting ever. Um, I did read the report to the legislature, and I'm just really impressed with the body of work and the importance of, of water supply planning for the region. Um, so basically what we're trying to, uh, what our purpose um, is that the regional vision will help set a tone and direction uh, of what we want to achieve for the region broadly um, among different areas of uh, council authority and influence. Um, why we want to achieve those things and how we will work together and the high level outcomes that uh, we hope our policy and plan, policies and plan can help us achieve. Um, some of the outcomes from this process are statements of values for the region, um, language that describes our vision and the key interrelationship among policy areas, and that's something for us to focus on today, water supply. Um, narratives of stories about what success might look like um, for us by 2050, and uh, high-level measures uh, of success. So we, um, we're, we envision a, a broadly a process between this um, high-level um, vision process where we do a lot of reflection and engagement like we're doing today, uh, as we get into plan, um, uh, as we, we we will draft language uh, that will engage the, the council and various stakeholders of the group. And as we get into planning, plan and policy development, like water supply planning, we may learn some things that may cause us to uh, refine our language. So as we learn um, learn things, we you know we kind of reset that foundation a little bit. But we want to provide some some direction for the plans and policies, but also learn from. Them. From there uh, as things are articulated in the future. So um, one of the things we're doing among our policy plans is trying to develop a, a, a um, consistent use of, of language across policy plans for, for first with this early work, um, values and vision and goals for the region generally among the pol different policy plans that we have including water resources and as we move forward start to develop objectives, policies, and strategies that work in service of that overall vision and so there's a uh, reinforcing a chain of accountability between um, what we set up as our vision. Um, and if we're not achieving these goals, 
that work towards our vision, then we can we'll know that and we can potentially course correct. Um, so what we want in terms of um, water supply in the regional vision, obviously we're consulting a whole lot of different stakeholder groups, including MOSAC, the Land Use Advisory Committee, uh, various um, standing advisory groups that we can have, as well as a whole set of other re um, regional stakeholders um, that we will identify in a broader public engagement plan. We want you, you understand, this group understands, and TAC understands the importance and complexity of water supply planning. Um, including a uh, relationship to other issues in the region, and that's what we want. I want to learn from you today and learn um, what uh, what those key issues are, um, and to help help get your help in articulating and framing water-related issues and values. For people. Um, so, and part of our exploratory work, we've looked at kind of ten regional issues. We analyzed uh, input from recent um, recent advisory meetings, and I believe there were three. MOSSEC meetings we identified, so there were 56 meetings in total that we looked at to see what was on people's minds, what did they emphasize. Um, in terms of, um, you know, I tried to identify what we think were the key exploratory issues that we were looking at in terms of affecting water supply planning, but other issues that we are looking at that are important to the region are like affordability, uh, housing affordability, um, transit infrastructure, um, welcoming and safe communities. Um, shared prosperity, but you know, so welcome all of your input. But um, you know, our assumption is that those highlighted areas are where um, you may have the most um, value to add. Um, we have a number of uh, milestones um, through the end of the year. Um, we will be um, reflecting and incorporating um, uh, local uh, insights and aspirations for local communities from comprehensive plans. Um, we will be reviewing what we know about our region's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats across a whole set of policy issues, um, continuing to explore issues, engaging advisory groups, and then we will have a statement of values, visions, and goals that the council will use, will set as a foundation, not adopt per se, but set as a foundation for future work to follow, and again, um, that could be revised as we learn more from the other engagement pieces about that. Um, so we're looking for, in our small groups, we're looking, how oh, much my minutes are in my hand? Uh, oh, zero. Well, this is what we're going to ask in our small groups. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Oh, wow. Thank you. And, and I, I, don't, I didn't hear the horn owl. I know, it's very quiet. You, you oh, okay, okay. Well, thank I, you. Thank I you for the word of shining. I did warn all the speakers that I had a timer. So if you hear owl shooting, that's their soft. Welcome, Raya. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Raya Smiley. I'm senior planner in local planning assistance, and I'm managing the community designations project. Uh, so, community designations as part of the big picture regional development guide has been a part of it since the very beginning. So, a few, a few versions of it. Uh, it let's, let's just say that. Um, uh, so, the community designations is basically um, a work that helps with um, furthering regional policy in the region at the local level uh, and, and the outcomes that are established in the, whether it be regional development guide and also um, when it goes down to land use policies and other policies because community designations are um, community specific mostly, uh, so they um, define certain roles for communities uh, to achieve through their local planning processes and implementation. Uh, they are used to um, basically drive land use policies and specifically density um, analysis and or uh, minimum requirements, uh, as well as distinguishing similarities and differences between so community designations is basically grouping communities into uh, those similarities and differences and trying to set policies that meets those um, similarities and differences in a way that makes sense for those communities. Uh, it sets a direction of a growth in urban areas uh, with infrastructure as well as trying to protect agricultural and natural resources in areas that are not within the uh, like say metropolitan urban service area for example. Uh, oh, I can stay here. Um, so the outcomes of this project is that uh, there are five pieces that will be coming out of this uh, project and that is criteria that will help us define community designations better and, better, and I will tell you what has 
uh, currently defined community designations in Thrive MSV 2040. Uh, those criteria will help us actually um, come up with those community designations. Um, they may look very similar to what they are right now, or they may be some refinements, which we are hoping to capture. Um, the, each community designation will have its own description and also density expectations. This is the one of the specific land use pieces uh, within community designations and, of course, maps. Uh, we have linked some uh, previous meetings from the Land Use Advisory Committee uh, here that you can uh, click and watch those meetings. The Land Use Advisory Committee is the main um, body that we're working with throughout this year uh, that will help us uh, basically make a final recommendation to the council for adoption, hopefully by the end of the year. Uh, so the variables that were considered in the last round, so, uh, uh, so Thrive MSB 2040, were five main variables that helped us group communities together. Uh, those five are the Metropolitan Urban Service Area, the percentage of developable land that is committed to urban uses, or you'll see it as percent developed in those maps. Um, age of housing stock, which was a proxy that we used for age of infrastructure because no better data was truly available. Um, intersection density, um, and as well as the long-term wastewater service area. So all of these put together uh, basically created those groupings of communities. Uh, the Community designations project uh, involves uh, quite a few different partners that, and stakeholders that we're working with. Uh, we are working with a focus group of local planners uh, who are helping us throughout this project, as well as a focus group of internal technical staff who are providing similar input, but um, from a different perspective. Uh, we're working with the Community Development Committee, as well as the Committee of the Whole of the Council. Uh, Land Use Advisory Committee, and OPSEC. Uh, we are also coordinating with other regional planning efforts such as the regional uh, values and vision and scenarios and other things that you will be hearing from. And the MOSAC, MOSAC's role in this project, or what we are hoping to get out of, is to get your take on specific um, variables or specific information to consider throughout this project as we're developing community designations as it relates to water supply specifically. Um, generally speaking, we have started this year in January by going to, by, by presenting this information to the um, uh, council's, uh, oh my god, Community Development Committee, uh, what CBC stands for, um, as well as starting to work with our, uh, engaging our stakeholders, both internal and external. As I mentioned, the Land Use Advisory Committee is the uh, body that will make that final recommendation to the council, but uh, this whole project is pretty iterative, so while we're talking with LUAC and our internal and external focus groups, um, we are continuously going back, refining the information, um, creating additional outcomes to be able to talk about what are the implications of considering certain data pieces. So at this point, uh, we have started to, we have engaged our um, stakeholders and, what's that, Al? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't hear it. Okay. Um, maybe I'll just move on from here. Um, <laughs> am I the end? Oh, well, these are the questions that we'll be asking you. <laughs> <laughs> Then, um, uh, hope to get your input as it relates to water supply. Thank you very much. <laughs> and now we have Dan Markell talking about scenarios. Here in your scenario. Thank you. Oh, which button do I click? Forward? Yep. There we go. Oh. You switched my picture. <laughs> I did. Oh, man. I, I have this great picture of three ladies standing in a field bird watching with binoculars looking at the future. <laughs> so come to my computer and I'll show it to you if you want. <laughs> These guys are walking in the future, that's fine. This guy, this guy. Um, so I am working with the process called scenario planning leading to the, the 2050 plans. Number 2050 plans aren't adopted until the end of 2024, essentially. So we've got two and a half years. This is a long-term project. The purpose of the purpose of the scenario planning is to consider more 
uncertainties in our in our 2050 plans, so that we're ready in case the future doesn't unfold the way we expect it to unfold. Normally, every time we come around one of these plans, we do uh, economic modeling to figure out how big is the region going to grow in the future. What's the economy going to grow like? Uh, a lot? A little? Will it shrink? Yikes. Probably won't shrink. Um, but how much will it grow? Then we also do where would that growth take place? Where would people want to be? Where would businesses want to be? Where would households want to be? So we will come up with numbers projecting the future. But there's a lot of things this time around that might change those. We don't exactly know yet what Telework's going to do to residential demand. Are more people going to want to live in Wright County or uh, at the edge of the region? Uh, are people go going to want to live in the center of the region because there's more amenity? Because that's like the lifestyle that they have. Are people going to choose to live here, live there? Are businesses going to want to be here or there? There's more uncertainty this time around, so we're engaging in this scenario planning. Uh, the outcome of this, I'm just going to focus on these last two, is that more nimble policies will get into the plans so that we'll be ready for the range of futures that we, we could see legitimately coming. And another thing about this is, by going through this as kind of like an early version of the planning process, we can incorporate water supply issues from the start, like they haven't been so much in the past. So, um, some big phases, uh, identifying forces and thinking about what those futures might be, what, how, what kind of ranges should we think about. Uh, I'll get to those in a second. Um, we're right now sort of moving into this phase of identifying the impacts that those futures might have on the infrastructure we provide and on the issues in the region that Mike talked about. What would the differences be? It will get towards um, incorporating the EVs into regional values and vision and what the policy options are, but that's later this year. Uh, this is largely across the, the year of this year, 2020, 2022, right? Yeah. <laughs> so here's our four, four futures plus the business as usual. Business as usual suggests everything just continues on as it has been. Uh, it just like things traject into the future. But we're also exploring what if it was higher growth or lower growth? What would, what would happen to our infrastructures and our issues? And what would happen if people would prefer to live in more compact areas or more dispersed areas? So when we take those two variables, we get four futures. That's our sort of uh, exploration for. Now, who's involved in this? Um, we started out uh, sort of at the end of last year. At the beginning of this year, we had some advisory volunteers, advisory committee volunteers. And I, I recognize some faces in this crowd from like this. Um, <laughs> it's nice to see you all in legs uh, and, and like uh, can come into the, the room and everything. Um, but so thank you for, for that volunteer. We, we've had a little bit of uh, engagement with folks. Now we're really moving into the, the the phase where we engage with more folks to say, how would these impact your lives and your futures? Um, we'll get into what we think of those effects and what do we want to do about it, but that's like second half of this year. How's the all doing? Okay. So we're, we've started with kind of technical staff, and by extension, you're, you're sort of our technical staff advisors. Uh, moving towards our advisory committees uh, and outwards towards city and county staff and elected officials, and then in 2020, middle of 2023, really sort of wide engagement with these futures. Um, today, we would appreciate it if we could just have a conversation about how do you think those futures would affect your work? So the questions we want to ask are, how would each alternate future press on water supply in the, in the region, from your perspective? What pressures would it bring to you in your individual work? What would keep you up at night in each of those alternate futures? And then how would they affect your shared work here at Mossack? Those are the three questions we're going to talk about. Hope to see you there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs>
Hello, uh, my name is Jack Kostrewski, and I'm here to talk about my project, which is providing search for white papers. Um, I also want to say I'm in a long time listener, first time attendee, so <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, so, the white papers project, the purpose of these white papers is to allow us, before we start writing the water resources policy plan, to take a step back and evaluate proactively what are the water issues for the region. What is the input that we need to learn about it, and where should we go as we are putting together the policies for them? Uh, the outcome that we're hoping to get from this project, with the input of regional stakeholders, including yourselves, thank you very much, um, we're hoping to take this white paper content and the conversations that we have with them um, and to have that inform our regional water policy. Um, it also is an added perk of perhaps there will be areas that we won't necessarily be able to wrap our arms around in when we tackle the water resources policy plan, but we can identify those issues that we should continue to investigate as we go into this next decade um, of the policy plans. In the uh, information item, we do have the framing papers attached. Um, so if you, when I say framing papers or if I to them, you guys have access to them. Um, and if you want to know any more about this, we don't have any meetings coming up, but feel free to contact um, I put Judy and Kyle's names up there first because they're not here. <laughs> um, but I also will take uh, questions as well. So first off, what is a white paper? Um, a white paper is a concise report that provides information about what we need to know about issues. In this case, the white paper is going to provide background on water issues, where we are in the region and what the context is for those issues. Uh, what the council's role is within those issues and what can we do, what levers can we pull. Um, what are our current connections with policies that we already have in existence? And then lastly, we're hoping to provide a menu of policy recommendations to go forward to address those issues. Um, our for sure target is the water resource policy plan. But because water touches everything, uh, we have hopes that the white papers will also inform the regional framework. Um, and of course, the master water supply plan. Uh, our process with or progress within this project, um, we started in 2020, and we had some internal council brainstormings to generate what we think the regional water issues will be now and going towards 2050. Um, additionally, we got some input from MOSAC meetings, so we were listening to hear what your concerns were as you were generating the MOSAC report. So we incorporated those as well. And we sat down and we wrote these framing papers. <coughs> the framing papers was the first cut of an iterative process in which council staff were trying to frame out what these issues are. We took those framing papers to our Water Resources Policy Plan Advisory Group, which we call the WAG, because that's way easier to say than that mouthful. Um, and so our advisory group started helping us reframe our framing papers from the local perspective. So we were really good at hitting the regional perspective, and so getting that feedback from our advisors helped us shine lights on what the regional perspectives were. We took that information, and this is currently where we are now um, in the process, so we're st taking a step back, incorporating all the feedback that we heard from that early phase, and we're starting to write those white papers. Uh, we will be writing the papers for the next year, um, and then we will pretty much take them on the road. Uh, we're hoping to use the white papers as an engagement tool to have conversations to make sure that what we have in there reflects what the region feels or thinks about these issues. Um, and then also getting feedback on the policies that we recommend within the papers. Um, the ultimate goal is to take that feedback from our white paper outreach and the white papers themselves to generate the water resources policy plan um, policies. And then the real big end goal is having the adoption in 2024 of the plans. I'm going to go over briefly the topic areas of the white papers. There are seven of them. Um, I, all of them do touch aspects of MOSAC, but I will try to highlight where there are direct connections to your focus areas. This is the first really big one, water quality. We even share the same title, which is easy to say this is a connection. Um, water quality is a huge topic, and we're trying to write about it in a hopefully concise report. And so, these are our topic areas that we are going to be touching on within the water, within the, the, the paper itself. Um, so we're going to be talking about the watershed approach. We're going to be talking about processes that, as contaminants emerge or come to our concern, what are we going to do about them in the future? How are we going to address them? 
Uh, we do have current contaminants that we are struggling with or working with, the challenges, opportunities um, of chloride, nutrients, PFAS, uh, manganese, and the VOCs that are in drinking water. Um, climate change is going to be a concern as we are looking at water quality in the future. And then we will have additional future challenges that we don't even know yet. So all of that is hopefully going to be summarized in the white paper for water quality. Um, and so while I did talk about climate in the water quality paper, we are having a water and climate specific focused white paper. Um, within this white paper, we're hoping to, or we will be identifying regional climate risks, highlighting the impacts on ES operations and planning, um, and then also impacts <laughs> yes, it will I'll go back really quick now. So, okay, thanks. Um, so, uh, highly impacts of the work that we do, the work that our local partners do, and then focus on adaptation and mitigation strategies. We do run the wastewater system, so we are going to have a wastewater issues paper. Um, these are the topics that we will be covering. Now, boy, really fast. Um, so that we're going to be hopefully tackling some of the challenges that we know about. Um, some of the future challenges for our system. Um, we will have a specific paper on rural water concerns. This actually touches with community designations, so it's a really good, um, very good lineup. Um, and so we know that there are some specific water challenges for our rural residents, and so we're hoping to address them within this paper specifically. Both community challenges, environmental challenges, and then future challenges. Uh, we did hear from our water advisors that water reuse should be a topic that we should delve into. So we did add this paper into our lineup. Um, we're going to be talking about the impacts of water reuse on water supplies. Um, stormwater reuse, wastewater reuse, both within our plants and facilities, um, and then also as an external option. The last two papers are spe specifically targeted towards um, drinking water and source water protection. Um, specifically for this one, source water protection in vulnerable areas. Um, there's going to be a tie in with land use and water protection. Um, there's going to be the challenges of overlapping jurisdictions that we're going to be hopefully bringing up and highlighting um, water contamination and emergency response. The last one is water availability. Um, having available water is key <laughs> to any sort of prosperity or livability. Um, and so the first area we're going to be looking into is making sure that there's access to the water. Uh, the second area is even if there's water accessible, it might not be able to be of good use. And so we're tackling those two issues. And then because there is a dynamic of groundwater surface water interaction, um, we're going to be highlighting that uh, issue area within this paper. Uh, this is the plan. We can't write all of the papers at the same time because there's not enough of us um, to, to do it. So we've split it. Uh, we are finishing the first round of white papers as we speak. Uh, second round are going to be launching pretty soon. And then the hope is to have the third round launch um, towards the middle end of summer. So that we'll have the last part of the year to wrap things up and like I was saying, take them out for engagement. Um, we don't have them yet. So first I will say your feedback is valuable, but now is not the time. <laughs> um, we will be coming back. Uh, to hopefully solicit that feedback when we have something to share with you. Um, but there's also cross connections between MOSAC and the Water Advisory Group, our Resources Policy Plan Advisory Group. Uh, so um, the member, so Patrick Shea is a MOSAC crossover member with our group. Um, if you want any updates, feel free to contact him. But also feel free to contact any of the um, ES staff. We can help make sure that if you have any comments, questions, concerns, uh, we can get information to you. With that, way over time, but here you go. Nope. Yeah. We gained some time, so. Thank you, presenters. I don't know if I've seen a slate of presenters hold that closely to time limits before. They're afraid of you. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> the owls. The owls. We're afraid of the owls. <laughs> owls are the, uh, an animal that represents learning and knowledge, so it seems appropriate. <laughs> and one of our plain language experts here at the council loves owls, and so I was kind of representing her um, <laughs> impactful speaking. <laughs> That's the sort of style. Um, I had let all of our presenters know that we would have questions for about oh, a little bit ahead of time, so a good 10 minutes for, for any questions, clarifying or, or suggestions. Any comments, anybody? I 
had one. Um, just on one on Leah's um, one of her slides, it talked about density expectations. I was just curious as to if there was more detail on what that means. Yes, um, for density expectations, basically uh, through the local comprehensive plans and comprehensive plan amendments, uh, cities based on their community designations have a minimum density requirements that they need to uh, meet for uh, new development and redevelopment. Uh, so that's the type that that's the kind of information that we receive through those plans and um, for uh, again based on community designations, those minimum density requirements are different. So, so those are those are made by the city, not necessarily by you guys having some they are, information. Okay. They are made by us. The the oh, requirement okay. is from the Metropolitan Council. However, the information then we receive it through <clears throat> from local communities through their comp plans, making sure that they meet those minimum requirements. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And they increased in the last round, because if it was three to five for a lot of places, and then it went up so that, to recognize the, the more dense development that basically uh, economic pressures create in the areas that have higher land costs. It, it was more kind of recognizing what's on the, the ground to make sure that it's feasible to happen so that when we're planning for water and sewer connections for that, that there's enough of them to support whatever land use redevelopment or development goes on. Right? Yes, and uh, if I may add, the uh, last round in Thrive MSB 2040 community designations uh, got a little more varied in trying to capture what uh, Wendy just was mentioning, uh, that differences and that, you know, the three minimum of three units an acre is not the best um, minimum for the, all the areas that are, um, you know, served through the regional wastewater system. So uh, the differentiation between community designations allowed us to be able to better um, show that differences between communities. Yes, please. Well, I just want to um, add a, a clarifying comment. It is can be kind of a complicated thing, but it is the the minimum is actually an average minimum. So different types of communities, kind of more or less based on market demand for new development, redevelopment. Some of that can be lower than that minimum. Some of it can be higher. Just kind of looking at that that what the average of that minimum is. For you, but it's really about discussion and, and the conversation that comes out of that. So, if you do, as you grab a snack, again, there are drinks in the refrigerator in the kitchen there and, and some additional snacks. Take bathroom break. Um, use the break as an opportunity to catch up with one another. I know you haven't had a chance to talk with each other in person for a while. Ask any questions. And on the wall, we have the questions that you'll be talking about during the small group discussion. So, if you do want to Kind of check those out and warm up what the conversation will be about. They are there. Um, it's 2 o'clock now. Should we reconvene at 2 15? All right. Thank you for because I always have subjects that are so clear in my head. But it's just so normal that I laugh. Yeah. Well, I forget the minimum. Yeah, in some Right. Yeah, yeah, you're It sounds like a lot of the first day, even as it gets out. I was just wondering if I can't the way it is on some of those old buildings, right? So, yeah.
I think everybody see that. Um, she, Annika just went to the bathroom. Okay, so we'll stall just a little bit. Um, we have three to special tables. I'm going to speak slowly. We'll catch Annika up. Um, but we are going to spend, once we start talking, about 20 minutes on one topic. So at this table, the group is going to be talking about the regional vision values goals. And at that table, the conversation is going to focus on community designations. And there's a green folder on each table that has discussion worksheets. So if that's helpful. Stealthy. We're all we're all a, a good accepting group. Uh, this table is gonna start out talking about the scenario report. So we are going to be kind of just having an open conversation. There's a, a little bit of structured suggestion about how to have those conversations. You might start with giving everybody a chance to spend a minute looking at the questions and jotting their own thoughts before you start talking. But then I expect it will go wherever you want it to go. Um, we're not going to be capturing detailed notes of these conversations. Our project managers are here to listen and to take with them what you have to say and incorporate it into their work. After 20 minutes, we're going to switch. So each of your tables has a second folder. So if you stay at your table, you'll talk about that next topic. If you have a really burning need to talk about something else, you can move to it. <laughs> but we'll come to that at that second discussion. Does that seem fair? All right, then. I, um, I guess the only other thing is I will ask just for the notes of this meeting so we remember what we talked about today. After the two discussions, we will have a large group report out. So any highlights that, that really struck you in your conversations that you want to share with the whole group, we will capture those and we'll put those in the meeting minutes. So, all right. Um, with that, I'm going to put a timer for 20 minutes on here. And I will come around in about 10 minutes just to let you know you're about halfway through. And again, at five minutes, if you want to wrap anything up, does that kind of be OK with you? If so I will turn you over to your small group discussion. Ta-da. <laughs> All right, go. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me know if you need anything. I think it will only be there yet. So, <laughs> cutting us off. No. So I, pro I, I, I propose a set of questions. One of the things I've been telling people is not to worry too much about like, like exactly what a value is, exactly what a value is, exactly what a value is. Sometimes it gets, you know, the kind of views interchangeable. So hearing your thoughts and your ideas and your ideas and your ideas. Something, how you frame it, or what you in person. My name is Brian. I'm a senior planner. Business, one of the project managers for few designations alongside Jeff. Both, both, yeah. I mean, I've read, you know, talk to each other. Um, anyway, before we yeah, jump into the questions, yeah. I want to make sure that uh, from hey, the I mean, the questions that make sense to you, you want to what you don't have any specific questions or big picture questions that you want me to answer. Well, I mean, I think the water is kind of like blood. So that you're going to sort of I just think I'm a little uninformed about the definition, like my idea. So I was kind of like, what does the surprise to you link? It's kind of like, okay, is this. Urban, urban brand of development. So I guess I kind of get that. Yeah. And then you guys were talking about their sort of perspectives on the values of the Baja communities. Is that what I was understanding? Yeah. Or like yeah. suggested minimums or something? Yeah. So uh, if you're referring to the density requirement, no, I have no. I actually have no idea what I'm talking about. Yeah. Like, well, so the question. Yeah. Well, I said, Baja needs to provide input on data and variables that are in the 
developing I don't even know how community designations are supplied. Yeah, so community
Yeah, how many were in the super? All right, it has been 20 minutes. You could be in the super. I don't know if I'm back to that. But if they're in the water, they're just poorly in water conditions. We're going to break shortly to talk about. I think it's like this, because there's ebbs and flows of water. It's really confusing. This is really helpful, and honestly, if something comes up, we didn't answer any of your questions. I didn't hear any of so I just talked to you. So do we move? I can hear by the voices oh, that you're not ready to be done talking. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to make it, oh, I would invite you to switch topics. That's cool. I'm kind of wearing the trans topics using my chair. So I will take my leave of you. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. 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 this table will talk about community designations now. Come in, meetings. So, Raya is going to come yeah. over here. Yeah, I'll be there. Oh, really? yeah. right. And for anybody who has a burning desire to see my first hot second. Okay. I do swap it out. Anybody with a burning desire to talk about community designations will be at this table oh, with Raya. <laughs> Our friend Dan is going to move over here and talk to you about scenarios. So if you would like to talk more scenarios, follow Dan over there. <laughs> and regional vision is for here. You got your day. <laughs> Do you want to put the blank one back? Oh, sure. Good, how's it going? Good. Are you going up to the next month? Water support is okay, Lars. This is, yes, this will be regional values. Yes, this will be regional values. We're not joking about this. Yeah, this will be regional values. We're not joking about this. Is everybody comfortable at that spot, or would anybody like to switch? So we have regional vision, community designations, and scenarios. Good? All right, another 20 minutes on the clock. And then at the end of that, I will ask for any highlights from either one of the discussions, and we'll capture some of the big takeaways, OK?
I think it'll be more like at the like at the yeah, yeah, I'll go to the reception the 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 I think it might be driven by. So, <laughs> that was an intense conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard hmm? some <laughs> comments. <laughs> My goal is not to keep talking too much. But I, I heard like a little snippet here and there. I'm like, oh, I wonder what's going on at that table. Um, so, your. Project managers were listening very deeply. I saw some really good notes being taken, so that will all go back to inform I'm sure that I can work. Read this <laughs> but I know handwriting is a little hard too. <laughs> so, so we didn't we did not capture detailed comments for our meeting minutes because the purpose was to shape your work. So we achieved that. Uh, but I did want to, for our own records, so we can share some ideas across the table to get. Any of the hi major highlights, burning questions, um, anything else you'd like to share that you talked about in your groups? And we'll just capture those. And we will include these in the meeting minutes, too, so we will remember what we talked about today. Um, so I will just open it up. We have, we're a little ahead of schedule, so we have a fair amount of time for this conversation. I think I have 15 minutes in the agenda, so we'll go until say 3.20, and if we still want to keep adding, we certainly can. I think Ali was going to give us an update on the Clean Water Fund appropriation request, but we don't have that scheduled till 3.30. So um, and did anybody, was it struck by anything particularly out of your conversation? I'm asking MOSAC members. I'm asking MOSAC members, but if you want to tap any of your project members, or if you want to, if any of the project managers have a question <coughs> for that's very handy. Dan. I, I will gratefully acknowledge that one of our members appropriately challenged the way we were defining our community or our, our different scenarios by saying this is very residential focused. In water supply, we look a lot at industrial use. And so the, it, that helped a lot bringing a dimension to the discussion, so. You said too, too city focused? Or residential, residential focused. Because residential. Mm -hmm. I think we think in terms of acres being used by residential development, industrial free water use can, can really twist the numbers on a small acreage. Mm -hmm. I just said that to get the conversation going. I'm going to stop that. <laughs> <laughs> My uh, coworkers are teasing me. I haven't done whiteboard writing in two years. So that, that came from Mike, which was which was a great comment. We were kind of challenging all of the assumptions for the <laughs> scenario thing because we were talking about that uh, having more growth and more dispersed pretty much can't happen because when you have a lot of growth, land prices go up, and when land prices go up development becomes more dense. So that that quadrant really didn't make any sense to us. I would challenge that. I don't think that happens. If people want larger yards and bigger property, that's I think that's what we see. I actually was thinking about that too. There's some things on density like if there's rent control and less dense development in the city, then that can't happen. And how does that, how do those things balance and swing against each other? It's an interesting question. Well, what we didn't bring up in our conversation either was how crime and feelings of insecurity affect density. I mean, the, the business community in downtown Minneapolis has really had a rough go of it, not to mention Lake Street.
something that came up for community designations on both tables. Uh, actually, both groups brought it up was the relationship between um, community designations and density requirements and water use and like basically whether or not um, whether or not there is enough water um, if we are requiring certain density levels and uh, development at, at, at certain intensity. I am learning that I miss autocorrect. <laughs> <laughs> no spelling judgments here. <laughs> Safe space. <laughs> Can I mention a comment, Lenny, in the last point that you mentioned here about the density and the relationship with water use? Actually, this point has been brought in the last uh, cycle of planning, and some of the communities were asking Met Council at that time, asking the water supply specifically that, if you know that there is some limitations in water supply in some region, why the Met Council is pushing development in that area? And, and, and that's a question, um, till now we don't have the answer for it, we're still working on it, but it would be very helpful if we can get some guidance from MOSAC members about such an issue, because it was raised by MOSAC members at that time in 2015, that Met Council, you, you ask communities to specific density to grow, but if this community have serious water limitations, that means that they're gonna they have to pay more for infrastructure to improve about that limitation. And so does that need to be considered? And most of the time, as you might hear, uh, water supply is not criteria in the community designation and the density also determination. So can I actually add something to that? It's th this is actually been this is kind of crossing out a little bit outside of the bounds specifically of the scope is that we have developments that you know were funded or um, financially incented by Met Council to grow in certain parts of the community. But then there are islands from both an infrastructure from water, sewer, and transportation too. So it's not just one thing that's missing. It's like all these things are missing. And then in order to build that, now you have to have this, this, in, this investment there. So while like the building might be paid for, you still got to drag sewer there, you still got to drag storm drain there, and still got to drag like, utilities there, you still got to get the transport people, which they become these ongoing costs that now the community's left holding the bag. And so it's kind of, or the individuals there don't have, you know, don't have the means to sort of sustain it, and that becomes kind of a, a challenge. So it's not just that, you know. I, I don't. I think that the issue of water supply maybe came up too late in the discussion on the last round mm -hmm. to really be considered, but it's being brought up early enough this time that we can do a better job of not only water availability, but are the soils appropriate for higher density development? I mean, Hugo's got some really wetlandy kind of places that just isn't going to work. Probably, you know, and that's there's a lot of places like that where we're finding out. Oh, when you put the the pipes in, they sink. <laughs> it costs a lot more to put in. Um, so maybe looking better at, at the, the natural environment and water availability in, in terms of projecting where future development goes. I think one of the things we had talked about in our group was that there's definitely a, a correlation between property values and density, you know, and I think that, and being, if, if we were really smart looking at it from a data-driven perspective, and I think, you know, we're kind of noodling this around, but didn't, didn't have quite enough time to explore this, is that you could, in theory, project out sort of like density and use by, as property values and growth increases, you know, density will increase in certain areas just because it's getting too expensive in certain areas will max out in density because everything's built that's gonna be built. You might change a couple homes here and there, but it's not going to really move the needle that much. But then new areas, the density will change dramatically because there's more people moving out there, and then they'll become more dense as new stuff gets built. So the example is that a home built like 30 years ago might sit on like three quarters, quarter acre of land, or sorry, three quarters to an acre of land. 
but then today's home, that same community, will be maybe a third or a quarter acre or less of land that costs like twice as much or three times as much. Oh, because <laughs> Exactly, because the prices has just went up and developers are trying to squeeze more out of that really expensive land. Which might help us in our planning. Well, and there's challenges where, the, where different designations come together. Like if you have land that's inside the MUSA adjacent to agricultural land, where you can only have one house per 40 acres, the land prices are really low uh, per acre in the, the agricultural, but there's a huge pressure to annex that land into the MUSA so that you can develop it with homes because the farmer wants to retire and could make a lot more money that way. Do the, like, the community designations and the scenario planning like connect to each other? Yes, good, okay. <laughs> yes, community designations, the intention is for community designations to work with our forecast model as well, which works with scenario planning in terms of the growth that you were talking about. Yeah, yeah and when, when we think about a regionally compact growth versus regionally dispersed growth, mm -hmm. the, those are chunked out by community designation. So we're using the policy instruments we have to ask those questions. Um, these are not great notes, but we also have this recording. <laughs> we aren't even looking at you as you're right. right. <laughs> <laughs> we stuff with water really high to make sure we walk away from this meeting. Yes, <laughs> let me know. Anybody else? If you want to keep thinking about it, we can go to our update and then come back and see if anything else is percolated up the mind. Does that work? Absolutely. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming here today. It's uh, very exciting to see you, all of you. Uh, for some of you, this is the first time that we meet in person. Uh, for others, uh, it has been two years that we didn't have a meeting in person. So. Uh, I think the last time um, when we had a meeting in person, I made the same request that we need your support for our uh, request for clean water fund. Uh, this unit, the water supply program, uh, received their, the main support, the main fund for this program, for the program is coming from the clean water fund. And so every two years we go through a process through the agencies and the Clean Water Council submitting our request for funding for the next biennium. And we have been receiving a, 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 a kind of a stable funding for two programs. The first program, we call it the uh, Regional Water Supply Sustainability, which is supporting a lot of the projects that we do around the metro area and for communities. Uh, one of the good examples recently, we have finished a feasibility analysis of water alternatives for the Northwest Metro, uh, where they are looking into different uh, potentials for uh, water supply, other than groundwater, because they are feeling some of the limitations in that area. And we work with communities like Reuters, um, Ramsey, uh, who else? Dayton. And so five or six communities will work together with them. They are developing uh, their alternatives for water supply for long-range planning. Uh, one of the other projects that we, are, we have been working with the West communities, uh, including Chaska, uh, Edinburgh, Edina, and a lot of these communities is the uh, looking into the potential for regional wellhead protection planning. And, and the reason for that is there is a lot of overlap of the drinking water areas in, in the Western Metro communities they don't have jurisdiction over their drinking water supply area because it falls into another political jurisdiction. And many of the times, the, even the technical analysis that one community is saying this area is, <coughs> is at risk, the other community have another technical uh, analysis saying no, it's not at risk. So based on that, there is a lot of land use decisions are made. And so communities in the West Metro, they are working together so that they can develop a one kind of regional 
uh, wellhead protection plan that could help them overcome some of these overlap issues. And that project is going to be transferred into other communities who are seeing the same issues. It's not only the West Metro. Many of the communities in the Metro, they have the same issue. And such like these programs and these projects, we have been uh, using the funding from the Clean Water Fund under this program that we call it the Water Supply Sustainability. And this is our biggest program. The second program that we receive funding for is the grant program, the Efficiency Grant Program. And this is totally a pass-through program with the cost share from the communities. And I think many of your communities received this, uh, <clears throat> this uh, funding for the last uh, couple of years. The program has been very successful. It has been very uh, popular in the metro area. Uh, we started with only 15 communities. Today we are about 40 communities who have been requesting the funding. Uh, when we started, we started with half a million dollars only. Uh, today we have 1.25 million, and the request came at 1.5 million. So we have to ration the amount of money that we are distributing to all, all the communities. We tried, we, uh, our, our, uh, our uh, main basic uh, principle here is we want to give everyone money. So we didn't say to some communities that you, we are not going to give you money for this time. So we rationed the amount of money distributed to all the communities. But at the end of the day, everyone applied for our grant program received money. So usually the process is start now until the next uh, legislative session, which is going to be next year. Uh, during this time, we put together all our requests. It goes to the governor office, and it's approved by the Clean Water Council and the interagency coordination team that's responsible for this. Our request from all of the communities who have benefited from these programs and will benefit in the future from this program, we are asking your uh, to support us uh, with, uh, we are going to provide you with the uh, letter of support that we have prepared from the past and we have used in the past, and we are asking you to send it to the Clean Water Council so that they can consider these program in their uh, in their final dec uh, decision about all of the amount of money how that's distributed. So with that, if you are, if your community is interested in supporting us or your county is interested in supporting us, please send me an email or Lania, and we'll provide you with the letter of support that you can fill and we will provide you the names of the people that you can send it to them, which is mainly the coordinator for the Clean Water Council, uh, Mr. Paul Gardner and we're going to send it to you, his email. Email is going to be sufficient. You don't need to send a letter or anything. Just an email will be fine. Mm -hmm. Any questions? So, Ali, I just have one question, because I know that last year, the last time you got to the water efficiency grant, it was very popular. Do we know how it was, did the, all the communities utilize the funds, or is there a lot of fund remaining? Uh, most, the last two rounds, all the fund has been used. This time, um, because of the COVID, yeah. uh, some of the communities have some uh, struggles on using the money. But it's really interesting. A lot of the communities who couldn't use all the money, they send it back to us. And we have a mechanism that we offer it to communities or other communities who are asking for more money to do work. And so the money that we receive from the communities returning it back to, our, to us, we are distributing it to other communities who are asking for the money to do uh, more in, in, in their program. So uh, by that, I think even the amount, now we are approaching the end of this term of the program, which is ending in June of this year, and probably we're going to have back about between 90,000 and 120,000. That's we're going to be rolling it into the next program, which is starting July 1st of this year. And so all of the communities who didn't receive the full funding that they requested, we're trying to make them whole using this money that is coming from back from this uh, program at this point. And luckily, this time, the legislature gave us more time because they knew that communities struggled with COVID in distributing the funding. So they gave us until 2024 to use this money. So this money is going to be available. It's going to be rolled into the next program. Thank you. So please, we need your help as we ask last two years, um, and we really need your help in this. This is, uh, these programs, um, the, the sustainability program and the grant program, uh, the Met Council doesn't have a lot of money to keep. We almost, most of these pro programs are either uh, through 
consultants. Uh, we contracted with consultants and we, we do projects through them or we give it into grants to the community. So uh, it's in a way, and, and I, I can tell you right now, Met Council is the smallest agency receiving from the Clean Water Fund. We didn't increase our amount more than 3% over the last 10 years. We receive only about 3% of the total amount of total amount of money available for Clean Water Fund. Uh, we could go higher, but uh, I, the competition between the agencies is very uh, big. And as you know, uh, the money is available for all the state. And so we try to uh, create programs that benefit communities in the metro area. And those two programs have been successful in receiving funding every two years. And we really uh, need your help in uh, pursuing this for the next biennium. With that, thank you. Questions? Thanks. Anybody else have any burning thoughts from our earlier discussions that you want to share out? I know one thing did come up in our group when we were talking about water softeners. I don't think water softeners are included in the water efficiency grants, but maybe we should be looking at that as a future eligible use to upgrade your water softener to a more efficient one. And Madam Chair, we started looking into that last year. We are trying, EPA is doing a study right now with more, which ones, are, which one of the makers are making the most efficient in the, in, the, in the market so that they can put their label, which is the water sense that we use. Mm -hmm. And I think they were, until, until before COVID, they were really going very fast with that research. Now they stopped over the last year, two years, because uh, their priorities have been shifted with the PFAS and so many things. Now, I think they are going back to do some of that research. And as soon as we have some names that's included in the water sense, we're going to include it into our program. Great. I think we were thinking of it not only from a water quantity standpoint, from quality to sure. understanding yeah. the sure. reduction, or even if specific ones that don't even use salt could get. Sure. Yeah. And that's something we've been very concerned about at PCA, about the contribution to chloride coming out of the wastewater treatment facilities. And we have some done some work to try to help support change outs and things like that. The good thing is I think that the water softener, um, that that is eligible under the clean, that the competitive clean water fund grant with Bowser. Mm -hmm. So I think community could still apply through it, but using a different, different through the Bowser, Bowser source. I think it was eligible to starting last year. Okay. But one of the problems that you don't know who, it, which, which one of the softeners is really good in conserving salt and water at the same right. time. Uh, and, and that's one, one of the reasons that we were waiting for the EPA because they get out these standards for all of the makers and it would make it easier for us to adopt one of them that's because it's used and, and they've done a lot of research on it. Yeah, so because it's basically what I'm hearing is that Newer is not necessarily better, but we just want to make sure it's the right one. That, we are just waiting the, for the yeah. EPA to say that this list yeah. is good. Go ahead, go ahead with it. We have tried it, we have researched it, and we have used it. And this is because usually when they put the water sense, they give you the water saving and the salt saving. So that's 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 done in a practical way that will help us in uh, making good estimation of how much water is saved or how much salt is saved. I would assume that. Any water softener change is better than one that's 30 years old. <laughs> Some of them are probably better than, than sure. others. <laughs> Any other thoughts, contributions that anybody wants to make? If there are uh, resources for cities to, in, to get technology upgrades to their water systems so that residents get notified when they have leaky toilets or leaks in the house. I know, you know, our city, we don't, we haven't chosen to make that investment in that technology because it's too cost prohibitive. prohibitive. Sorry. And uh, I know some some cities have, so, um, so I think if, if that's a resource that could be made available for some cities, I think that's um, probably money well spent. I'm glad that you brought this, Kevin, because we are testing with one of the communities who doesn't have the system. Uh, they're installing uh, what they call it the meters collectors, so that because some of the communities, and you know this better than me, they build their 
uh, the, the customers every three months. And so the only time that the customer will know that there is a leakage is when every three months when they see that now I have to pay 500 bucks instead of 150 in my water bill. What we are doing now, we are testing with one of the communities want to store what they call it meter collectors into certain places around the city so that they can detect quickly if there is a leakage in a group of community, a group of cities or a group of houses in one area they will try to trace it back and know where is that coming from. And instead of waiting until three months, they will do it in a very quick time uh, so that they can alert the homeowners. And as soon as we get some research about that, then we'll include it in our program. Our intention is to go back next year to get more funding so that such like this technology is going to be helpful for communities. So thank you for bringing sure. this. This is really good. Yeah. Yeah. And I think at our table here, one of the things that did come up too was that there's also a cultural shift that can happen where individuals can take more responsibility by having the awareness over, you know, like small leaks, small water usage and consumption, you know, modernizing, you know, like uh, toilets and things like that, that can make a dr dramatic impact if they're aware of it. Because I think oftentimes um, people just don't realize how much a small leak will add in terms of water costs for themselves, or just add in terms of water use over a long period of time, um, or just modernizing some, you know, you know uh, like toilets and sinks and faucets and shower heads and things like that can make a big difference. So there's this education that, even though we kind of take it for granted that nothing's changed and not using it any more than I was like 30 years ago, you know, you know, a little fix here or there can save a lot of money or save a few dollars for people. And so that education can be really, really impactful across a large population. Yeah, I, I got a new toilet in February, and I could not believe how much my water bill went down. It was, it was more than a third drop. <laughs> Well, we have three bathrooms, so we're going to do the other two toilets, but I'm waiting to see if Lakeville's going to include a rebate for new toilets in the next year's program. <laughs> Manya, did you have anything else? I do not. I, I just kind of want to ask, this was some different people bringing, bringing some different conversations into this committee, and so I just wanted to ask, what, did anything surprise you in your conversations, or this is to project managers or committee members walking away going, huh, I didn't think about that. I just got to think about things that I never think about, so it wasn't like necessarily, huh, it was just like, oh, this is new, okay. <laughs> I know for um, for us, it, um, we emphasized the importance of water supply and considering data related to uh, to this topic and to our projects. While we had been thinking about it, this is given at least for me designation, given more context to specific focus areas, if you will, within the larger umbrella of water supply. Yeah, I mean, what was pretty clear to me is that I, it feels like there's a, that values around water are fairly clear and fairly universal. Um, it is so important so for so many aspects of society and for the region, especially this region. Um, and so that feels like kind of like a, an easy approach and that the values that we have uh, established over recent decades of living with with natural systems and respecting natural systems and um, we have become predominant. And so that like the, our vision is kind of, I might propose that to do, continue to do more of what we're doing, continue to respect water as a resource for the economy, for, for individuals, that's in our DNA, uh, you know, as, as humans, as, uh, as Minnesotans and, um, you know, and uh, um, that the, you know, our challenges are uh, pretty somewhat well understood and how to get there may not be, there's competing 
you know, demands on this resource, and there's some pretty significant challenges, but they're fairly well defined. So um, I feel pretty pretty good about.